So the next speaker is became one of my friends, actually. So I saw him speak two years ago, I guess, at Conversion Hotel, and I was like blown away. And I thought, this is a really smart person, and turns out he's, well, he's smart, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, if you get to know him, he's just like a really, really normal guy, but he's so eloquent. So every time we get a discussion, then um, he knows more words than I do in English. Yes, and then I can't win. <laughs> and that's, that's a big deal for me. But, um, so I'm trying to teach him Dutch, and he knows how to say I'm fantastic in Dutch. That's the only thing he knows. And, and Vogelbeck deer. I don't know the English words for Vogelbeck deer, but he knows it as well. Um, so, and he's going to give an amazing talk, which he just finished today. And I'm very much looking forward to the ending. So, give a round of applause for Jono. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, ticky thing. You all right? Ready? We're going to do this? Phew. Wow. Awesome. Come on, Yoshi. Come. All right. Welcome new citizens. Welcome to Orientation 101. It's good to be joined by so many of you today, fresh off the production line. My task here today is to help you to understand your role and the life in front of you. Now, I know that things may be a little confusing at first, so bear with me, but pay attention, because what I'm going to tell you will shape your future your success in life, your career, and everything that comes next. Pay attention. This is the city. It stretches to infinity. For most of you, the city is all you will ever know. Look around you. All that you see, and all that you will ever likely see, forms part of the city. You are all part of something very special. Good work. The city is governed by an all-powerful AI. Legend has it that many generations ago, it was our ancestors who created it. They designed it to help to bring order from chaos, to organize us, and to make us better citizens. That's what it does. It's transformed our world. It's augmented and improved us. It designed and manages the city. It structures our lives, and it connects all of us. The AI is named Global. Kind of appropriate, because like the city, it is everywhere. You have all been programmed to recognize this logo and to feel a sense of allegiance when you see it. I see that for some of you, your conditioning may not have kicked in yet. Don't worry. Stay calm. Everything will be all right. You can think of Global as your mentor, your father figure, your best friend. It sees and it knows everything. It keeps records of everything. It does this to better understand you, to help you, to protect you, sometimes to protect you from yourselves. It's watching and listening right now. Wife? You see, the AI decides how the city's finite resources should be distributed. Because whilst the city is infinite, our resources aren't. The reality is we suffer from overpopulation, and there are limited opportunities to go around. Our environment is degrading and changing. So we can't just sit back and do nothing. As responsible citizens, it's our responsibility to earn our food, our keep, and our shelter. So the system decides what everybody gets using a series of sophisticated algorithms based on who deserves those resources the most. So how does it work? Well, the core of its approach is to reward wellness. What's wellness, I hear you ask? Well, wellness is a high level of physical and mental fitness. Take stock of yourself. Consider that as we move forwards. You see, a society with high wellness is happier, healthier, and more productive. As individuals, high level of wellness is a good indicator for survivability. It helps us become happy, well-adjusted people, like these happy citizens. Wellness collectively 
gives us a happier, more productive society. It reduces the risk of addiction and early death and disease and other unpleasantness. Global measures our wellness and makes decisions on our behalf. Each day, the AI grades you and puts you in a list. It's like a league table, and all of us are in it. From today onwards, you will get a number from one to infinity. We know that behind that process, there are much more complicated scoring systems, and it's very nuanced, and we'll explore some of that later. But for now, just consider you will have a number. The people at the top of this list will get the best rewards. They will get access to more resources, more food, better shelter, better careers, better salaries, longer holidays, better living environments. They will be happier, healthier, and more successful. So, the question all of us ask, that the question that all of you will spend the rest of your lives asking, is how do I rank higher in the results? <laughs> this consumes us. It, it draws all of our attention and our focus. It's all we consider day to day. We are obsessed. Some of us are addicted because scoring highly can be the difference between life and a less pleasant life. The people at the top reap all of the rewards, and the people lower down get the scraps. The AI defines wellness in the form of three laws, not without a sense of irony. It gives us the rules. It wants us to understand. It knows that if we follow the rules, we will be happier, more successful citizens. So, what are they? The first law of the system is that you must be healthy. You must eat a balanced diet. You must exercise regularly. You must be strong and fast and flexible and respond to your environment. You must be fit in both mind and in body. The second law is that you must be creative. You must be innovative. You must stand out and surprise and delight. You must write or play music or create beautiful art or somehow contribute to society. You must challenge how people think and behave. It's not enough to reproduce work that has already been created. And more importantly, you must create a legacy. Produce something that outlasts your brief time in the city. The third law is that you must be popular. You must be well-known and well-liked by those around you. You must meet many new people. You must maintain a healthy and, importantly, a diverse network. And you must be talked about, wanted, and loved by others. Excelling in all of these areas is a huge amount of hard work, and it's difficult to balance all of the requirements. It takes time, effort, and resources, and continual resources to achieve all of these. And none of them are things that you can tick off and complete on a checklist. You've got to work at these criteria day in and day out. And even if you achieve a high scoring on the list, that can change very suddenly if you slip. And to make it harder, we don't know how we're doing in different categories. Remember, we only get a score. We have to make educated guesses as to where our strengths and our weaknesses are, which forces us to improve in all of the areas. It's a very clever system. Now, I appreciate this might feel overwhelming. Don't worry. Today's orientation session is your first step on the path to become a happy, well-adjusted citizens. The most important thing that all of you need to remember is that this is a perfect system. You must trust in it. It grades you for your own good, for all of our goods. It perfectly assesses everybody's wellness and grades them accordingly. It never makes mistakes. Coincidentally, there is no process for manual appeal. Why would there need to be one? It even adapts to change. And whilst I've talked about the laws and the system, these are gross oversimplifications. These aren't static, immutable things. Whilst the laws don't change much, the way in which the system interprets them does. And as society changes and the people in it changes, so too does how it judges and grades us. For example, if everybody becomes more creative, then you will need to become more creative still in order to maintain and increase your rank. 
If people on average become less healthy, then the system will give greater rewards to people who are healthier. This constant, tiny rebalancing of the system happens on a scale that we can't begin to comprehend. So as the world becomes more complex and the city gets bigger and the types of things in the city become more diverse, the system learns and it improves. It's even starting to be able to predict the future. It's built up so much data on how we behave, collectively and as individuals, that it's starting to know what we want before we do. It knows how we're going to behave, and it can take action and rebalance the system based on that knowledge. This is important to understand, because whilst the system is perfect, we are not. Even the best of us is flawed. You see, the original system didn't anticipate that people wouldn't just follow the rules. The original designs didn't anticipate that people might be selfish or irrational and that just rewarding good behavior might always not be enough. Even though healthier, fitter people are happier and more successful and all of the research we have shows this to be the case, people don't act rationally. For example, some people spend all of their time trying to reverse engineer how their grading works. They say, why do I rank in this position and not that position? Or why have I dropped two positions today? Or why was I slightly higher last year? What's changed? Despite being told just to focus on improving themselves. They try to work out how the system is grading them. They obsessively compare notes with each other about what they did or didn't do, trying to draw conclusions. They try to test which behaviors impact their rankings in certain ways, despite having no idea what the AI is actually measuring or how it's measuring it. Often, sadly, these people perform poorly compared to how they might have if they'd just invested that time and energy in becoming better citizens. Or, at worst, they're just counting and measuring numbers that make no sense, that the system isn't even necessarily using. Worse still, some try to cheat and to trick the machines. They do things like they pay people to talk about them in an attempt to convince the AI that they're popular. They get other people to create public works of art in their name and showcase it as their own. Or they try to hide their levels of fitness and health by taking illegal drugs and supplements and misreporting to the system. The reality is, because of this, Many people cheat a little bit. They say everyone else is, so I have to too. They think they need to cheat to stay ahead. For many people, it's become normal to tell small lies. And most of the time, they get away with it. The design, the system doesn't know, or it doesn't make sense for it to report every single one. They don't care in the grand scheme of things. Some of them do get caught, and they get punished, and their rankings drop. But hopefully, they learn their lesson and they change their ways. Some people spend all of their time complaining about how unfair the system is. Again, they could have just been spending these resources improving themselves. They say, when you're at the top, it's much easier to stay at the top because you've got more time and resources and money and more time to consider and evaluate. They say, it's hard to be creative if you're not popular. It's hard to be popular if you're not exposed to new stimulus and healthy. They say, if you're lower down the list, you might struggle to gain the resources to compete. And some people, say that the system is evil. They say that it's unethical that the system doesn't care for individuals, that only the system cares for itself, that the list is more important than the people in it. They say that the system doesn't care who wins, only that the best rise to the top and doesn't care if people are hurt along the way. They say the system exists only to feed itself, to grow, to sprawl, to consume all of our resources and to devour our world. Of course, this is propaganda by dissidents and malcontents, and we should dismiss their views if only these people had spent their time and energy becoming better citizens. Do not worry. I know this is a lot to take in, but obviously it goes without saying that all of you will be good, productive people. There is no need to cheat or to worry or to fear the system. Love the system. Just focus on doing good work and everything will be fine. But not everybody is as well-behaved as you. 
even though we're all trying to follow the rules and become better citizens, their disruptive opinions and behaviors sometimes ruins things for everyone. So the system introduced a fourth law. It needed a way to manage bad behavior and even sometimes to punish those who tried to manipulate their rankings. The fourth law is that you must act with integrity you must be completely honest and transparent in all of your dealings with the system. You must not attempt to deceive the system. Trust that the system knows best. Deceiving the system may lead to punishment. Now, don't worry. Mostly, the system just quietly adjusts everybody's rankings. Sometimes, it will make an example of a prominent offender. Occasionally, people get banished and are never seen again. But generally, everything is fine. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's not like the system became some kind of evil AI monster. It still wants what's best for us and to help us become our best selves. But it had to have a way to regulate a system, to understand what good behavior looked like. Don't worry. These are just cautionary tales. You're new here and haven't had the chance to pick up any bad habits. If you follow the rules, everything will be fine. Anyway. The system prefers rehabilitation to punishment. Most of the time, it's not economical or in the system's interest to punish every small infraction. The system wants us to be good citizens, so it's in its interest to educate us rather than penalize us. So it offers us lifestyle advice. It tells us not to obsess about where we are in the rankings, it tells us not even to check, just to be happy and carefree. It gives us advice and sets down ways we can approach and interpret the laws in our own lives. It even provides us with a series of envoy droids who are here to advise and help us. They tell us that they're around to answer questions and give us feedback because we're not able to communicate directly with the AI. It's far too sophisticated for the likes of us and it's thinking far too abstract in nature. We are small and insignificant in comparison. We need intermediaries to translate for us. If you have any questions about how the system works, you can ask them. There are some global droids here today. Hands up if you're an Envoy bot from Global. There are some, you're, well, ish, ish. There are definitely some kicking around somewhere. But off the record, where are, I need to just check they're not listening. Off the record, they are independent systems too. And we're not sure that they can communicate directly or clearly with the system. So they try to give good advice, but what they tend to give is generalized. Rarely specific recommendations and rarely for specific individuals. Sometimes, really check they're not listening, it's not clear what their agenda is, if they're working to help us or to manage us. And perhaps, sometimes, maybe they don't even know. Anyway, enough of that. Let's give you some context. Let's explore a case study. I appreciate this is a lot to take in, let's make it real. I want to give you some real life examples of how you can follow the three laws in your day to day life and some slightly scarier examples of what happens if you fall off the rails. This is the main thing we're going to go through today. We are extremely privileged to be joined by a very special guest today. I, I deliver this session all over the city to every batch of new recruits, and we include this case study in all of our training material, and it's a very special person it's about. He's here today. Where is Taco? Stand up, Taco. Big round of applause for Taco. There he is. Many of you know Taco, many of you love Taco. Um, it's very brave of him to be here with us today and to give us permission to tell his story. The next 10 minutes or so is all about Taco. This is a story about his journey. I'm so glad you're sat in the front row. This is a story about his journey. It's a story about how important it is to invest time in being smarter and healthier and more popular and more, well, it's not working, more creative and better behaved. It's a story about how when people see their rankings drop, they can be driven to extremes and they can make particularly poor decisions. It's a story about why it is so important that you all follow the rules. Many of you know that Taco contributes to society through the medium of stand-up comedy. Don't you, Taco? <laughs> We all have our gifts and our roles. They're assigned to us at the end of orientation. Mine is to educate people like you. Yours, you'll find out at the end of this course. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> this is his role. He's not the best at it, but he's okay. He's a decent comedian. He used to be really popular back in the day. 
He produces relatively good content, which his audiences seem to enjoy, but more recently, things started to go wrong. His rankings, once relatively high, had started to decline. Ooh. Fewer people were coming to his gigs. His reviews became less positive, and he began to panic. He leads a good and productive life. He's a pretty good person. He's relatively healthy, relatively creative, relatively popular, but he got complacent. Now, there are younger, healthier, fitter, more creative people than him. And their content is more relevant to the audience. It's more engaging, it's better crafted. So his peers started to outrank him. It's not that he'd got worse. His content was still good. He was still a great guy, but everyone else had got better. His problem was that he'd just kept doing what he's always done. The same old content delivered in the same way to changing audiences who wanted something new and something different. He'd never been a perfect citizen, but he'd been a good one. And until recently, that was enough. But the world and the people in it and the city had changed, and he hadn't. He didn't want to change the way he'd always done things. It, was, it, bleh, it had worked okay until now, and he was comfortable, so he started to resent the system. Why should he change the way he ran his life and made decisions and the content he produced for some ethereal, abstract idea and overlord? He was comfortable, he was successful. He never really stood back and considered that the success he had, and that he had had, was because the system had been rewarding him. He realized that it wasn't enough to sit and wait. If he wanted to improve his position and regain his lost rankings, he'd have to change. He'd have to put in extra effort to increase his wellness to rank more highly. But remember, the system doesn't tell us where our strengths and weaknesses are. We only get a ranking number. He had some ideas of where he might start. He was a little bit out of shape. His content was stale. He was becoming less popular. And because he was already behind the curve, he wanted to find some quick and easy opportunities to improve his rankings. So he studied the three laws, and he came up with a plan. The first law, remember this, is that he must be healthy. He'd have to get fitter, faster, better. But that sounded like a lot of work. <laughs> lots to think about, lots to schedule, things to check every day, and bigger, scarier lifestyle choices that he'd really need to consider and work at. But he'd give it a go. Maybe he could find some quick wins. So he audited his health. He went for a checkup. The doctors and nutritionists helped him analyze in great detail everything he was eating, all the exercises he was doing, and his lifestyle. They produced a list which told him all of the issues, all of the opportunities, and all of the risks. Now, he'd hoped that he might find some kind of silver bullet, a one big thing that had caused his drop in rankings that he could just fix. He could cut something out of his diet, he could eat more fiber or do more exercise, something easy and understandable. But there was no magic bullet. There wasn't a single easy thing that he could just do to fix things. There were hundreds of tiny tweaks and things he needed to do and keep doing every day in order to stay fit, and it was a bit overwhelming. You see, the problem wasn't that there was one big thing that needed fixing, it's that he had loads of small bugs. The main thing the audit found was that his unhealthy lifestyle meant that he was always a bit ill. A sniffle that wouldn't go away. His lack of attention to small self-care details meant that he was always poorly. And over time, these things built up and got worse. Because he didn't address them, they became systemic. And the idea of fixing all of these things became overwhelming. He didn't know where to start. And as he looked around, he saw that other people struggled too. He thought, nobody's perfect. All these other people are eating too many donuts, they're overweight, they're drinking too much. I don't see them at the gym. And they've all got sniffles and bugs and aches. None of them are fixing these systemic problems. So he wasn't motivated to address any of his issues. He thought, why bother if they're not either? But it wasn't just his health that these bugs were affecting. Because he had all of these issues, nobody wanted to spend time with him or to come and see his content. And those who did left very quickly because it was such an unpleasant experience. 
Even on his better days, the good content he produced went unnoticed because people didn't like him. His bugs impacted not only his health, but his creativity and his... Po- you all right down there? You should, yeah? Yeah? <laughs> you see, he wasn't healthy. He was fundamentally unfit. Because he had all of these bugs, it made it hard for him to keep up. And not only was he falling behind, but because he was so unfit, he lacked the motivation and the energy to address it. And the things he did to improve his creativity and popularity fell flat because he couldn't follow them through. That meant the content he was producing wasn't engaging his audience and the press weren't giving him word of mouth and coverage. He was slipping into a cycle of failure. One night, a man approached him in an alleyway after a particularly disastrous gig and said he was called Mr. Gray. Mr. Gray said that he could help turn things around for Taka. He said he would be willing to write new content for him, for a fee, of course. He said that he had other clients in the same industry, and he writes all of their content, and they are very successful. And Taka knew that people did use such kind of services to produce some of their content. And whilst he knew it wasn't always of the best quality, it was certainly easier than him spending hours and hours writing his own material. So he thought back to the second law. The second law that you must be creative, and even considering this amount of work terrified him, especially when he was already struggling with the first law, when he was unfit and unhealthy. He said, I don't have the time or the health or the network to do this. So he thought, I'll invest some money with Mr. Black. Mr. Black, Mr. Gray, who's Mr. Black? to cut some corners. And in the meantime, while Mr. Gray was producing content, he could worry about his health and he could get back on track. So he commissioned Mr. Gray to write him some content, a number of new pieces to add to his repertoire. It didn't cost much and it was certainly easier than him spending hours crafting his own content. And what he got back was of an okay quality, not as good as the stuff he might have produced given unlimited resources, but okay. And when he started using his new content, it made a bit of a difference. Even though he was still sick, and even though people didn't really enjoy being around him, an influx of new content helped him attract new audiences, and his rankings improved a little. But then things went wrong. You see, adding new content had made him seem more relevant initially, but it just wasn't on topic. You see, Taco's audience, like every audience, is unique. They have particular needs, tastes and preferences, and the generic content that Mr. Gray had produced was thin, duplicated parts of other people's content, and wasn't really tailored and didn't take his audience into consideration. The quality was low and the messaging didn't land. His rankings dropped even further. Audiences left quickly, they weren't impressed by his content, and certainly didn't recommend him to their friends. And of course, the system, all-seeing and all-knowing, saw this happen. It understood that the content he was producing wasn't relevant to his audience, and his rankings dropped. You see, he wasn't being creative, and his content didn't stand out. He hadn't produced material that his audiences wanted to receive. He hadn't considered their needs, he'd only considered his own. Critically, he'd cut corners at their expense. And his competitors, who had understood their audiences, who had put the hard work in, who had crafted content for their needs, had outranked him. Mr. Gray said, the problem isn't the content. He says, the content was fine. The problem is, Taco didn't have an agent. Somebody who could get him connections, promote him, introduce him to all the right people, and to build his popularity. He said that he could get him more industry links and more coverage. He told him if he had better connections with more influential, popular people, that that might increase the size of his audience. If he could get loads of people to recommend him and endorse him, it might make his content seem better. And of course, Mr. Gray could provide this service for a cost. He said that it was normal to use an agent to build these kinds of links. And Taco knew that some of the most successful people do have agents who promote and recommend and introduce them, and certainly it was easier than him spending hours and hours at networking events and making friends and maintaining relations, all a lot of work. Especially when he was very busy maintaining his health and trying to write content and do all the other things. 
So he thought back to the third law, which is that you must be popular. He knew he needed to build a reputation and build an audience if he was going to succeed. He knew he needed attention from journalists and from more successful people than him. And even though he was still sick and unhealthy, and even though people struggled with his content and left his gigs immediately, and even though he didn't really have anything interesting to say to these audiences, he paid Mr. Gray what little remained of his savings in exchange for getting him a load of industry links. He got introductions to influential journalists, peers, and influencers. Tackle told them all about himself. He described what he does, shared some of his content, and pitched to them about why they should come to his show and review him. And whilst they listened to his introductions and nodded politely, nothing came of it. You see, he didn't listen to them or their needs. He just talked about himself, and the conversation was entirely about him and not about them. Mr. Gray said he shouldn't worry, and instead they should do something bigger. Instead of trying to network with industry influencers and get links one at a time, he should try a big campaign. They'd host it at a different venue, one which gets a much bigger, albeit more generalist, audience. And it'd be great for awareness and make it more likely that people would want to come and see his shows. So he invested a fortune in a big PR campaign. And it was a hit. The content he launched was funny, accessible to a broad audience, and everyone loved it. He got phone calls from journalists and got loads of new industry links. It made him hugely popular for one night. Everyone was talking about him, and his rankings went through the roof. But the next day, people had moved on. They'd forgotten about his campaign. And because the content wasn't really a good fit for his core audience, and because he hadn't hosted it, it had happened somewhere elsewhere. It hadn't really fixed anything. His core audience hadn't increased. He hadn't solved a problem. And the system realized that perhaps he hadn't earned those links and those recommendations and those reviews and knocked him back down. Taco started to wonder if perhaps, just maybe, he'd been getting bad advice. He hired a private investigator to look into Mr. Gray and his business. It turned out that the content he'd been provided had just been taken from other people's material and reshuffled a bit and sent back to him. It turned out that he'd actually paid for all of the industry links and the coverage that he got. None of it was authentic. All the people that he'd paid were dubious characters who did this professionally. They took money in exchange for briefly turning up at events and sending out reviews. And of course, Global had understood all of this and that those links and those coverages shouldn't contribute to his rankings. He wasn't popular. He'd bought and rented some temporary attention, but he hadn't made people like him. He created a brief flash of attention, but nothing meaningful. And through all of this, he'd lost precious time and precious energy that he could have spent on becoming a better citizen. So when Mr. Gray approached him again, Taco told him he wasn't interested. He told him to leave him alone, but Mr. Gray was insistent he had a solution. He said there was one last thing that Taco hadn't tried, one last gamble, and he should hear him out. He said that there were rumors of other places beyond the wastelands, other cities, other systems, other ways of living and thinking, worlds governed by different rules where you don't need to worry about the three laws, worlds where global doesn't see or monitor everything and it's easier to get away with cutting corners. Mr. Gray said there was a risk that the audiences might be a bit smaller and some things might go wrong, but he would be happy to help Taco migrate. Obviously, this is nonsense. The city is infinite and global is all-seeing and all-knowing, and there is nothing beyond global's reach. Taco, appalled that he had spent so much time and money with a madman, told Mr. Gray as much. He told him that he never wanted to hear from him again, and he walked away. Things were looking bad for Taco. He was unhealthy, he was uncreative, he was unpopular. His rankings were lower than they'd ever been, and he didn't have a plan. So he sat down and thought about everything he'd done and everything he'd learned. He had a moment of realization, a light bulb above his head, if you like. His problem was that he had only been thinking about himself. He'd been obsessing about his health and how it affected him and not those around him. He'd been thinking about how he could create content without spending his time and energy, rather than creating content that would help and delight his audience. 
He'd been thinking about how he could get other people to talk about him, rather than how he could be interesting and friendly and useful to other people. You see, the, the, system, the secret to getting all of this right is to, to think about your impact on other people. It's much easier to be popular if you listen to what your audience wants and how they feel and what their concerns are rather than talking about yourself. It's much easier to be creative if you tailor what you're producing to fill gaps in people's needs and experiences. It's much easier to do all of this if you're fit and well and healthy. So, he went on the diet, looking good, well done, started exercising more regularly. He started fixing his small bugs. He referred back to the results of the health audit he had, and he read up about symptoms and fixes and began addressing those problems. There were still hundreds of small things he needed to do, but he tackled them a few at a time, a few every day, and gradually things started to improve. He noticed that people were finding it easier to discover his content, and they weren't leaving the room immediately, and his rankings started to improve. He started writing new content. He thought about and researched what his audiences were interested in. He talked to them, ran surveys, engaged with them, and tried to find out what made them think and what makes them laugh and what solved their problems. He spotted gaps and opportunities and invested a huge amount of time in starting again and really crafting messaging and content that met their needs. And he kept reviewing it over time and improving it based on what his audiences wanted. And his rankings increased further. And he changed how he was talking to influencers. And he made sure that he was adding value. He listened and he learned what other people were talking about. He looked for existing conversations that he could contribute to positively without just talking about himself. And as he did this more often, he found that people were recommending him and introducing him and saying great things about his content. He reached newer audiences that he might never have been able to reach if he'd just done self-promotion. His rankings started to do quite well. Now, Taco is on the road to recovery. He's doing really well. He's back to where he was before. Let's have a round of applause for Taco, who's come through a lot of challenging journey there. Good work, Taco. He's done a lot of hard work to get here today, and we appreciate that. It's been a treat. That's the end of this parable. Um, I do have some closing thoughts that will help you. I think none of these principles and none of these learnings are particularly complex. They do require that you work at them and that you focus on quality and working day in and day out to be fitter, healthier, more creative, and more popular. They do require continual effort. Taco's journey took the hard way. He learned through failure and lost precious time in the process. None of you have to learn through failure. You have access to a life coach. <laughs> you can get advice on your health and your creativity and your popularity. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be thinking about improving yourself every day. This is not a hack or a cheat. This is a framework of behavior. And you still need to do the work. You still need to channel your expertise and your passion and your focus to be better than everyone else out there. Because, and this is key, as society gets healthier and more creative and more sociable, the bar will rise for all of you. You will need to work harder and to think about what your interactions with your audiences say about you. It's time for you to go out into the city. And remember, Global is watching. Good luck, new citizens. Wow. Oh, Jono. Thank you. Now I think you're really smart again. Yes. One talk. Ich bin fantastisch. Yes. <laughs> you are fantastic. <laughs> so we have ta a time for two questions, maybe? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yes, it's a really hard <laughs> talk to come up with a question. <laughs> Just, just in case anyone missed it, this is yes, meant to be analogous to SEO. <laughs> Wait, so, I, I followed you most of the way, but I am uh, I'm struggling with the you create good con content and uh, you keep investing in it and, and the system will reward you. Is that, is that hyperbole? Is that sarcasm? Like, is the parable meant to be like, Hey, this is the the message that Google gives you, and we're supposed to know that. Global, global, global. I've done enough. I would never say anything. Um, no, you absolutely nail on the head. Um, 
so um, global would definitely tell you that all you need to do is keep following the rules and creating good content and everything will be fine. I think the reality is, is much more complicated. Um, there are many, many people producing content and nothing happens. Marketing is part of reach and um, promotion. You, it's not just enough to create stuff and hope that something happens. You need to be talking about and promoting the stuff you do. You need to be doing that ethically, morally, in a way that's sensible and good and telling real stories and doing meaningful stuff. Yeah, chances are if you just make something, it's not going to magically get found. But, and even if you make something that's much better than what everyone else has... It's not necessarily enough. No, not at all. Right. Yeah. You, need, you need a flywheel. Okay. Right. Another question? Yes. Back there. Yeah, Brent, you have oh. to throw it. You can do it. That's the cost of asking a question. You've wow. Got to oh. oh. Would be great if it hit the balcony. <laughs> yeah. But are there real other cities? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not allowed to talk about this, but there are rumors. There are rumors of cities where the third law doesn't apply. Rumors where you don't have to be popular. Rumors of cities where you can exchange money for rankings. <laughs> Rumors of cities where you can continually exchange money for rented rankings. Um, all of this is obviously nonsense. Um, even if they do exist, they are so far away from global and so tiny that it doesn't make sense to take the long journey over there. And it, look, it's going to be rubbish anyway. The city is so wonderful <laughs> that anything else isn't going to compare. Yeah, but if all of us go and try them, will them make them popular and... The, the, like yeah, we, we could, a mass exodus, but many of us are very comfortable. Many of us are very happy with the way the city works. Certainly, those of us who are at the top of the, the system, why, why would we want, like, we, we depend on having this hierarchy. Okay. It's very difficult to answer questions in, in character, isn't it? <laughs> you did wonderfully. Can I have a round of applause for Jono? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.